the flip side is we need to think about the demand side for economic education. Um, and this is, of course, our students. And so what is it our students are doing should be a big part of shaping what we think useful economics is. So let me show you some data on this. Um, the American Community Survey now asks people their college major. So what's helpful about this is for the first time ever in large scale data sets, I can identify people who went, went to college and learned economics. But the most important thing, remember I started with that, with, with Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, you'll notice the top 10 occupations that economics majors are in. You know which occupation's not up there? Economist. So I think this really should shape who our market is. We aren't teaching Janet Yellen. We're teaching instead people who are going to be engaged in the ordinary business of life. They are going to be buyers and sellers and savers and investors and importers and exporters. We can also look at what industries they're in. And you may have had a view that perhaps all of our students are off going to finance, and for sure some of them are. But actually a whole bunch of non-economists are going to finance as well. What you see is actually most of our students are off in professional services. And I think the other thing you see is that the economics majors, that's the purple bars here, are going into roughly the same industries as the non-economics majors. So they're going out to play the role of economic actor. And there's a whole bunch of different roles, and in many, many of these roles, the question of what is optimal policy is not particularly relevant. The second major force shaping, I think, the demand side is the rise of women going to college and women taking economics. So this shows you the proportion of economics majors who are female by birth cohort. So I was born in 1972, and in my economics classes, about 35% of the majors were female, except those in Australia, not America. And this is US data. But we see a, a very sharp increase in the number of female students. Um, and I should be totally clear about this. It's not that women are increasingly drawn to economics. It's that women are increasingly drawn to college. We're now at the point that women are getting close to being 60% of all undergraduate students. But if I, I think it then means that the people sitting in front of us when we teach are very different than they once were. It was predominantly men, presumably largely interested in business careers, and now I think it's a substantially more diverse group. So as I said, you know, if I show you what, that, what this graph looks like for all other degrees, they've also feminized as well. Um, so I think when you put these two lines together, you learn two things. One, we still haven't feminized as much as the rest of the profession. And secondly, the change in economics is in fact more dramatic. And so I think trying to think about what this means, I don't have a complete answer to this yet. Um, but actually through uh, Worth, we actually ran a, a survey of a bunch of, um, ran a survey of economics instructors asking them exactly this. And some of you may have been in the survey. Um, what, is, what is it you observe differently about your female students? What do you think that they want more? And um, you know, it, it was a very rich survey. It's hard to do justice to all of it now. Um, one of the things that I got out of it is actually they're a lot more like my sister-in-law. Um, they're very interested in the pre practical realities of what it is that this time in class is buying. Um, and potentially then, um, I'm going to take a step further, be a little bit more courageous and say, I think this is also yet another force looking towards more of useful economics. What I want to do now, you know, I, I, I hope I've made the case that the opportunities that we have are different than an earlier generation of economists, and the students we're teaching are different than an earlier generation of economists, and I think together they give us a notion of, a somewhat different notion of what we should be teaching relative to what we learned when we were sitting in the, in the pews. Um, and you know, I've called that notion useful economics, but I want to try and give it some content. But let me give a few examples. The first, let's talk about how we teach comparative advantage. The standard textbook example is a question of uh, England and Portugal who have to decide how much wine versus cloth each of them should produce. And we show them our students a little two by two, and we ask them, should Portugal produce cloth or wine? Now, the principle of comparative advantage is an incredibly rich principle. It's essentially a theory of task allocation. We all are involved in allocating tasks every day in our lives. This is absurd. So first of all, England and Portugal, they're a long way away. Secondly, cloth and wine, who cares? But I think even more, even more important, this is sort of teaching as if it's Janet Yellen we're teaching. There's no one, no, none of my students are going to get to decide whether England produces cloth or wine. In fact, the whole question here is completely wrong. There is no one on earth who decides whether Portugal <laughs> decides to produce cloth or wine. Because that's not how decisions are made, right? Instead, there are individuals who are trying to decide what they should do with their time. 
and they need a theory of task allocation. And comparative advantage is that theory of task allocation. And so, you know, we are involved in these tasks every day of our lives. We have to decide within my family who's going to walk the dog. We all are involved in trying to decide what to produce at home versus in the market. So for me right now, I'm thinking, who's, who should do my taxes? Should it be me or should it be my accountant? Uh, within a firm. So let's take the firm that you're a part of right now. Who should teach principles of economics? The answer isn't necessarily the best teacher. The answer is the principle of comparative advantage. It's the person who's going to do better at principles relative to the alternative. So it's all about opportunity cost. So you wouldn't want to take someone who is terrific at teaching uh, intermediate micro and have them teach principles of macro because the opportunity cost is much higher. Or between firms, and I think this again is a very clear example. Should Microsoft be involved in making hardware? They are, by some measures, very good at making software. Um, so should they be involved in making hardware as well? I think the traditional way we're taught comparative advantage actually speaks to no one in the economy, and more to the point, it's, it's not useful to our students. But I think thinking about it instead as a theory of task allocation, and then demonstrating that, there are, that you are involved in allocating tasks every single day of your life, some of them from the trivial, who should walk my dog, to the deeply substantive, as a manager, should we be involved with producing both hardware and software? Um, I think that is a, a form of useful economics. The next is think about externalities. The standard way we think about this, um, you've read this textbook, a factory emits pollutants into a river which hurts the fishermen downstream. What policies will ensure efficiency? Turns out our students aren't going to be the policymaker who gets to decide whether you get to put pollutants in the river or not. Now, some of our students may actually work in factories, um, and other may, others may emit pollutants, but the, the, the focus on optimal policy here, here, I think, misses the fact that externalities are a very real part of their lives, and then they're, they're going to need to think about ways in which they can uh, figure out useful solutions. So, you know, think about a business example. Within most firms, it's almost always the case that the sales manager says, I want to hire more sales guys, right? And they say that because if they hire more sales guys, they'll sell more stuff. If you sell more stuff, you'll get your bonus. What the sales manager's never thinking about is the externalities of his or her decision. If you hire a bunch more sales guys, then IT has to buy a bunch more computers. Operations is going to have to support a whole bunch more offices. There's these negative externalities on other divisions through the, corpora through the corporation. That's a real life externality that our students are going to have to deal with. And so they're going to need to think about how is it you can internalize those sorts of externalities. Um, so rather than talking about you know, putting a, 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 a tax on the, the polluting factory, we could instead think about making sure that whenever sales wants to expand their workforce, they also have to put aside money for the computers that will have to be bought, internalizing the externality. It's the same basic economic logic, but it's now directed towards the, the roles that our students will actually play as economic actors. One that will resonate for sure with our students. Think about when they have to do group projects. Um, there are enormous externalities when someone's lazy, when they drop out, when they don't do their, their part of the share. How can they create institutions to make those groups function uh, more efficiently. And then beyond that, the theory of externalities is actually really important for intrapersonal decisions as well. Why is it I eat too much? Why do I exercise too little? Why don't I study enough? And all of those are because my current self is in a battle with my future self. My current self says, well, I could go running today, but I don't really feel like it. Uh, and my future self is the, the the poor bastard who's going to get the negative externality as a result of that, right? And so externalities actually really explain a huge amount of my own personal failings. A deeper understanding of that and then ways in which I could try to internal, I could use economic theory to internalize that would be really helpful. For instance, um, what do you want to do if someone's exerting, a, if, if um, running is a positive externality on my future self, what do we want to do when there's positive externalities? We want to decrease the price of them, right? So one thing I could do is, uh, instead of paying 20 bucks every time I go to the gym, join the gym up front, and then the marginal cost of going to the gym now is 20 bucks lower each time, and it's more likely that I'll actually go. Or make it so that you know, every time I go to the gym, I can then after that you know, go buy an ice cream. Uh, I can allow my future self to start bribing my current self to be making better economic decisions. And so this is all very much, we already know all this. This is standard textbook economics and thinking about externalities, but it's trying to think about is there a lens through which that's actually going to help me make better decisions. I don't want to harp on the personal ones because it risks trivializing economics. And so I do think it's just as important. You know, the reason I give the business example here as well is to say the same principles are going to be 
also quite helpful directly in the, in the real economy. Um, and so the final example I want to give is, you know, I think I, I have a much stronger sense so far about how to do this, as in how to teach useful economics when I'm thinking about microeconomics. And I'm just starting to turn my, my mind now to the same sets of ideas for macroeconomics. And I don't, it's very much a work in progress. I don't have all the answers, but I think with greater thought we can get there. And to give an example, let's think about the standard treatment of the theory of investment. The theory of investment is that investment is some function of the interest rate, that higher interest rates make it, uh, uh, make it more expensive to borrow from the future rather than do stuff now, and so that will lead you to invest less. Okay? And so we always talk about this as how many machines should some unspecified widget factory invest in given particular interest rates. But all investment is is a trade-off between should I forego today in order for a benefit tomorrow. It's intertemporal decision making. And we make these intertemporal decisions all the time. So our students are quite clearly involved in the process of human capital accumulation and trying to think about should I forego you know, the nice life, you know, going out and having fun like many of my friends are doing today in order to have a, a higher and steadier salary tomorrow. And, and our students are definitely involved in that business. There's useful information that we could bring. We could talk to them about what the returns to human capital are and how different parameters would shape and lead them to make different decisions. Think about social capital. Should you invest within your community? Our students are because they're just joining a community for the next four years. Uh, maybe they'll make different decisions when they're seniors and they're no longer going to be a member of that community. Um, health capital. Again, we can talk about, you know, should you go to the gym? The payoff is in the future. Uh, and what are the things that determine your willingness to make investments today that are going to have a payoff into the future? The same theory of investment that we use for thinking about how many machines to install at the widget factory is the same theory that applies to all of these decisions as well. And so I think the broader idea here then is to also reorganize macro not around national accounting aggregates. So we normally teach macro with sort of one class on each national accounting aggregate, one on, a class on C, a class on I, a class on G, and a class on X minus M. Um, it's not that big of a shift instead to think about the roles that our students play in the economy. A class on consumption, that is trying to decide how much to spend, um, and it's something obviously that our students are deeply involved with. A class on investment, uh, thinking about your role not on the national accounting aggregate investments, but your role as an investor who has to be making the temporal decisions here. Um, and I think you can do the same for thinking about our students and their roles as importers and exporters. So the homework exercise I want to give you, um, if I'm allowed to give homework, is take your favorite Take a particular session you're about to teach or open a textbook to a favorite chapter and then think about how we would reshape or reteach that if what we were trying to do is be involved in the business of teaching useful economics. Um, think of some examples of how theory can be made to be useful for our students in their roles not as policy maker but as buyer and seller and importer and exporter and manager and boss and worker and the other roles that they actually play. And then in order, of course, to actually create the space for us to do that, we have to do the other exercise, which is we have to think about the ways in which sometimes we teach students stuff that they don't need to know, because probably we are naturally, intellectually, we identify with the policymaker, but I don't think that should necessarily be our role when we're in the classroom. Um, so let me end there. I, I think the idea is simply that uh, we should be focused on teaching useful economics. Useful economics, as I understand it, is the roles that our students will actually play as economic actors. It's focused on making good decisions, and it's got to be based around broadly applicable principles. And I think we're at a, a moment in time that because of both supply and demand forces, the sets of opportunities we have and the sets of things that our students want to do that we're uniquely well suited to, uh, to be involved in this.